Welcome along to the RT Soccer Podcast, Raf Giallo here. You can watch or listen to us uh, every week on RT.ie, Apple, Spotify or YouTube and subscribe to to get the latest episodes as they're published. Today I'm joined by Graham Gartland and Johnny McDonald and we're going to be looking back on St. Pat's victory over Bowes in the men's FAI Cup final. We're also going to be talking about Waterford's playoff decider win over Cork City, uh, which has met, means promotion to the Premier Division for next season and also looking ahead to the last fixtures of the year for Stephen Kenny's Ireland, which we'll see the boys in green head to Amsterdam on Saturday for the final Euro 2024 four qualifying fixtures and a friendly against New Zealand and uh, lads uh, hope both of you are both of you are doing well obviously Graham you were on uh, commentary duty for uh, for the cup final yesterday and Johnny McDonald as Graham has said uh, is in kind of DJ mode today with the uh, with these headphones <laughs> he's pumping the Pat songs oh, into the headphones there yeah and I'm sure you you're yeah, I'm sure you're going to be delighted, uh, or you're delighted, Johnny, given uh, the uh, the result yesterday. But before we talk about the cup final, let's uh, watch the moment that the full time whistle was blown and Pats won the cup for the fifth time. Ball eyes on the referee now. Whistle goes to the lips. It's all over, and St Pats reclaim the FAI Cup for the fifth time in their history. For the second time in three years, it is joy unconfined for the men from Inchicore and for their manager, John Daly, that unshakable inner belief that he has, the belief that he infused into this talented young squad has borne the ultimate reward. All right, so that is the moment Pats uh, won the cup for the fifth time and uh, actually the second time in three years now. And again, like 2021, the beat bowls, although this time it didn't go uh, to extra time or penalties. And Graham, as I said, you were there um, in the stadium on commentary duty all the way through the build up. And, you know, when you look at the attendance figure, 43,881, and then you look at the, the atmosphere, even from TV, it looked amazing. It was amazing, I have to say. It was totally enjoyable to, to be part of it in, in terms of doing the commentary. The day belonged to St. Pat's. Um I think I think it's a great advertisement for the league. I think it's it's a real barometer of where this could go if the right people get behind it and the infrastructure comes. Both clubs have really engaged in their communities, which is massive, and we've seen that with the sellout. I think it's attracting a lot of neutral fans as well, like kids that play in national league levels. I've seen a lot of them that were that were at the game. Um, I'd say everyone in Inchi Core was at it. It was just a fantastic occasion. It's probably up there as one of the best occasions the league's ever had with, with, with a record attendance. I think the build up to it was brilliant. I think full credit to maybe the FEI and, and the, the people behind it, the flags along the keys for both teams. Those billboards, I never, I, I don't know if Johnny, like Johnny can, is a, around a little bit longer than me, but I've never seen the billboards for for, F, for games. And I always used to say, why well, don't they have billboards for Cork games in Cork or uh, advertise things down in Cork, the way and advertise things in Derry and things like that for the area. And, and everything about it was brilliant. It was really, really well done. I know the fans may be being a bit upset that the displays weren't on, on used, and I can understand that because a lot of work went, probably went into them and they probably wanted to show it. Um, but I'd say Pats fans aren't probably overly bothered about that because they come home with a trophy. Um, and on the game itself, it was just it was just brilliant. And like I said, it's that watershed moment where you can, it shows you can fill a stadium. It shows you can, does people want to watch this? Can you get the right investment in? Can the government really get behind it and make sure that this isn't just an anomaly, that it's something that we can build on and it can happen every year and we can increase the attendances because we increase stadiums. And once the stadiums start getting better and the people come through, the playing the playing squads can get better and the training grounds can get better and it all flows one way. Uh, in terms of the game, I thought, I thought at the start of the second half, Pats came out unbelievably well I thought they played with a bit more zip about their game they transitioned really well I thought on the break they looked dangerous but they played forward really quick and they ran um, and then like you, you look at who they lose then Moraney goes off and Forrester goes off and you're looking thinking they have massive players with massive experience like I think Jake Moraney played in the in a cup final over for Hearts against Celtic in 2019 um, so like he has a lot of experience Forrester's obviously that's his third FAI Cup having played in four finals but but the energy that the young players brought on and Johnny will talk about Alex Murphy I mentioned him coming on I says he'll run here he'll, he'll go 
I thought Alex Nolan done well. Oh, sorry, Adam Murphy, apologies. Alex oh, Nolan yeah. done well. Mason Media, Tommy Lonigan scores. But they just brought an energy to them that just took away any type of momentum that Bowles could build in the game. And I'm full credit to John Daly because he finishes with Sam Cortis, Tommy Lonigan, Mason Media, Alex Nolan, Adam Murphy. Oh, I think they're all under the age of 20. And and that's where I like I gave Jamie Lennon man of the match. Sam Cortis probably could have got man of the match as well. I just thought that Lennon gave them a platform. Them young players around him, he gave them such a platform to go and express themselves because he was always there whenever the game, uh, whenever Bowles tried to get a bit of momentum, it was him that made tackles. And in the end, he probably they probably totally deserved to win the game. I know probably and totally don't go together, but they totally deserved to come out victorious in the game. And I, I was really happy for John. Um, it's been 10 years since his father passed away, John Zer. And you would have seen John Zer all the games when we were kids. I played against John from the age of 11. He used to batter me because he was six foot two at 14. And he'd be getting elbows and all. And John Zer would be like, come on. And, uh, and he was my next door neighbour when I played in Scotland. And I used to talk to John, his dad quite a lot. And again, I was delighted for him. Um, and even Alan Matthews doing it as well. But I think Johnny will express what it means to the club and what it means to the fans better than I can. Yeah, Johnny, on those two things, the occasion overall, and I guess also for the Bose supporters, I know they'll be disappointed with the result, but the you know the huge attendance, um, and this has been growing for a number of years because we saw it a couple of years ago, it was huge, and then um, you know Derry and Shells brought big contingents last uh, last year, and then we've seen it go up uh, go up another level, and then on top of it, Pat's performance in what was a good game to watch as well. Well, I, I, look, Graham has touched on a whole lot of things there, and he's right about everything that he's touched on. But for me, yesterday, um, it was it was the industry that we talk about all the time. That the industry sometimes is not here. You know, yesterday was the, was the product. It was the industry. People are going to look at that game all over Europe and say, "Wow, did you see the cup final in Ireland? Did you see the atmosphere? Did you see it? The goals, you know." And you know, as I said, that was just the industry of. The League of Ireland, the National League, the FAO, the clubs individually. You know, it was Bowers and Pats on 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 the day. You know, if it had been Rovers or Bowers or Cork, I don't know whether it would have filled the stadium. But it was proper, Raf. It was proper. It was done proper. You know, I travelled over from the north side. There wasn't enough darts. I didn't know Bowers had that many fans. I think Bowers probably had more fans at the game than Pats. And they made brilliant noise, you know. And I said it after the game, I've lost two cup finals, and it's horrible. It's horrible to lose cup finals. I seen Gary Keller going going over to the you know, Declan Devine after the game, shaking hands with him, and a nice touch, you know, because it's tough when you lose and everything else is going on around the madness of, of winning. But a brilliant product that we have, you know, and people on the day looking to go to the match couldn't go to the match. You know, wasn't enough. There wasn't enough darts coming from the north side, from Port Marnock all the way across. People couldn't get on the darts. So, brilliant, brilliant occasion, atmosphere. As I said, forty-eight thousand goals. The weather was good. You know, I say brilliant atmosphere. Uh, just, just on the game, I, I didn't think Pat started too well. They were cagey enough. Obviously, Balls got the penalty. You can say it was it was a dubious penalty. I thought it was a penalty. It was right in line. It was down that end of the pitch. I just thought it was a penalty. I just thought it was just a tiny bit late, and I thought the rep was right on top of it. But one thing I'd, I'd say, and this comes from, you know, from the manager, they never panicked. They always looked in control pats, and I was looking at Lennon, Forrester organising the midfield. Bowls were sporadic, and he done things. Things were happening every now and again with Pats, they seemed to be in control, lots of possession of the ball, knew what they were at and knew what they were doing. I'm not saying Bowles didn't, but that comes back down to the manager, his calmness, his belief in the players. Uh, Graham speaks about the players that he brought on, the energy. You know, Alex uh, on the left hand side, Alex Nolan, come on, he, he was brilliant. He's doing brilliant stuff down the left, and two minutes later, he's winning possession back down on the right hand side. The energy, the, the age of him. And that's brilliant from a player's perspective that the manager trusts you. He just went, look, lads, we're taking his off. Two top players, as Graham said, off he's coming to the cup final. There was no win decision. And given the players total respect going onto the pitch, I know you can do this. This is your day. And I just thought Pats were in so much in control of the match. Uh, and 
I just thought he never looked like losing it. He, you know, a couple of lads was with me at the game. He said, oh, one nil the ball was seven minutes. I said, lots lots of time in the game. I said, and Pat's just settled into it. It went a bit flat about 10 minutes before half time. But as Graham said, Pat's come out in the second half. And I just thought they were well in control. The lads he brought on, Adam Murphy, you know, uh, Nolan and... The goals, look, I just thought Bowles lost away in the second half. I, and I'm just looking at Joe Redmond there in, in, in the clip that you showed. You know, he was such a loss for Pat Stewart in the season when he was injured. They lost a few games and points. So, from Graham is saying from a club perspective, I spoke to the chairman, I spoke to Garrett the night before the game to wish them luck. I was out in the hotel with the team on, on, on the Saturday night just to wish them luck, didn't interfere, just hello. Best of luck tomorrow, lads, and whatever. And, you know, they were in having a quiz night before the match. So they had everything down to a T. Everything was prepared. But it was the perspective of the club to lose the manager mid-season. You know, in fairness, the team, Tim's put the team together. John has taken over. Done fantastic. Right decision at the time to do it. You know, losing players like, you know, Joe during the season, still qualifying for Europe. And a, and a trophy, a brilliant season, and I think Graham is right. I think the whole of Inchi Car was was in uh, the community was in in the Aviva yesterday. Let's listen to uh, John Daly, uh, the Pats manager, uh, first, and we'll break down the game a little bit further. Relief etched on your face, but uh, you know you won this uh, competition fair and square. You've got a St. Pat's uh, scarf just thrown at you as well for good measure. How does it feel? No, I'm obviously delighted for the boys looking over at them there celebrating. They put a lot of effort into the two years of being here, not just this this season. And um, no, I'm thrilled. I'm delighted for them. Delighted for my family. I've obviously had to put up a lot of stick me living away from home. So um, absolutely thrilled and over the moon. I can't. I really. Uh, you know, it's hard to put into words. It's a, it's a fantastic feeling. Um, you know, commiserations to Bowes. I thought they played well on the day. And, you know, we were obviously a lick of pain from going 2-2. Um, and then Tommy obviously puts away to make it 3-1. And you could see they were just deflated after that. And it was probably done and dusted at that stage. The importance of set pieces, though. I mean, Jake Mulroney was so important to two of the goals. Yeah, well, we spoke about that. Uh, Graham Kelly... One of the girls he used to work with, Dealer Waves, on the pro license, has done a study this year about uh, the Premier Division and set plays. And we've scored the most set plays. We've been the best defensively, most efficient at set plays. And I told the lads that it's going to be a massive part. Theirs was a penalty, two uh, free kicks from ourselves, and then obviously a mistake that Tommy punishes. So set plays are huge, huge. I think we've gained the most points this year from set plays as well. So I don't mind that. It's part of the game. and. If it's something you're going to be good at, then I'll take that all day long. How brave was it of you as well to put your faith in, in youth? Obviously, when we see Lonergan scoring, Melia, Murphy, Nolan, you know, that's an extraordinary faith by you in those young men. They're good enough. And, I, and I, I'm not just saying that, Blase, I genuinely mean it. They're good enough players. And when you're good enough, you get opportunities. And for me, I was very fortunate to get a, an opportunity as a young player and it's great to be able to repay that to young players, give them opportunity to play first team football, playing an occasion like this, record attendance, you know, delighted for the fans, unbelievable, turned out in massive numbers this year, you know, and it's great for our lads and the fans now, we're all going to go and enjoy our night. Well done, John. Thank you. That is Pat's manager, John Daly. They're speaking to Tony O'Donoghue full time. And uh, anybody who's, uh, if you're not, if you're uh, watching it on YouTube, you'll obviously have seen Jake Mulraney there and also Alan Matthews uh, on the pitch afterwards. And uh, Graham, in terms of Jake Mulraney and what John Daly was saying there in terms of how they set up uh, in terms of set pieces, because that's the first two goals, the one for Mark Doyle and then the uh, Novak own goal as well. Uh, you might talk to me a little bit about the two sides of it, how Bowles maybe should have defended it, but also just how brilliant Pats were in terms of not just the delivery from Mulraney, but uh, in terms of their positioning when the uh, balls were coming in? First of all, you, as somebody who's probably going to be uh, trying to attack them, it, you know, you you got to get across your man and, and, and make them runs and hit them areas. But if the ball doesn't arrive when you're when you're on the move, it, it's a wasted run. But you, you might drag someone with you. Mulraney's deliveries were brilliant, really unbelievable deliveries I have to say that the first one the keepers can't come the only way Talbot can come is if he's coming to punch because he's not catching them so he has to he has to maybe try and come a little bit early and punch um, from an attacking point of view when you make your run and you know that ball's on the money you're going to have a chance of it you're going to compete for the header it's not like you said it's not a wasted set piece 
Um, from a defensive point of view, for the especially the second one, I, I did highlight at the time when I was commentating, for the defensive free kicks, Afalabi stepped up the pitch, and I found that very strange, because for corners he came back, and for corners he came back and let him be the free man that would go and attack in the, in the middle of the goal. And I just felt for the set pieces, he probably should have done that as well. Because, again, his deliveries were a lot more dangerous from set pe- or from free kicks than they were from corners. And I just was, I found that a little bit strange. I said, look, you're, you're being exposed here and you have a really big, powerful lad that's standing up front, not really doing a lot for you. Um, so I thought he could have brought them back. If you see the second goal, the note, I think the first one, Kukulovic, he just gets the he gets the wrong side and then he gets held off. I think he has to go and be strong there. I think as soon as that arm comes out, you got to pull that arm down and go and and you go and head it with him and and you clash heads, you clash heads, you take a sore one, no problem with that. The second one, uh, Novak's getting a little bit of criticism because he's probably twisted the wrong way in terms of he's not coming onto the ball. But Keane Bourne is the one that drops a little bit too early. He breaks the line and he drops five yards, maybe two or three yards too early. And that catches no no out because he's probably holding his line. Keane Bourne drops, which then he, Joe Redmond isn't offside. So he has to put a foot on it. He just he just has no other option than that the direction he's going and ends up there. So from a defensive point of view, the first one, they just need to be stronger and be more competitive when it's coming in that flat. You just go and you, you go through the side of his head and the two of his might clash heads and the ball doesn't end up in the net. I'm not saying you do it on purpose. It's just a competition. The second one, I think, just Keane Bourne just deepens too early and that catches out the line and it really hurts them. But I go back, I prob- if I was looking at it, I probably would have said, look, Connolly, you stay up, you're quicker. And I'd bring Afalabi back and just put him in the middle of the thing and say to Moraini, you're going to have to go over him with your set pieces because they, they were coming in, they were arriving flat. They started obviously high and then they arrived flat. But um, again, brilliant deliveries. I and mean, when deliveries on the money, you can go and attack them the way Pats did. And obviously, ultimately, Bowles did because it was an own goal for the second one. Yeah, as you said earlier, Johnny, Bowles started the game reasonably well. Obviously, the penalties you mentioned uh, that Afalabi won himself when Breslin tried to um, sort of tackle him from behind and sort of got it wrong. But uh, then second half, there was a there was a period when Jordan Flores moved into midfield after McManus, who was on a book and uh, went off and they seemed to grow a little bit back into the game. Um, and he obviously hits the post from a free kick as well, but they seem to peter out then uh, in the in the remaining part. And Pat's, uh, I think as Graham has alluded to already, with so many young players on the pitch, actually managed that period of the game really well. But just just to go back to what you initially said about in, in the goal, the, I thought Bo started the game well, and I thought Grant on the left hand side was giving Sam Curtis a bit of a problem. A couple of times he went, he stood, he went out a one v one. Sam Curtis actually fell over at one stage. And I thought Grant was doing really, really well. It was him that came in off the right, the left hand side, and played the ball in, in. In I think it was him that came in and played it into fee for the penalty. But for some reason or other, he stopped playing the ball out to Grant. And I just thought like it, it was working so well for Bowles. Dylan Connolly wasn't causing as much problems down the far side. Breslin was dealing with him because he had the pace to deal with him as well. But uh, yeah, well, you know, I, I just I couldn't understand why Bowles just didn't. Keep feeding Grant, keep feeding him because he was for the first 10 minutes. I just thought I said, Pats might be in a little bit of trouble here. And Jake, in fairness to him, as such as a, a, an attack and positive player he is, sometimes his defensive work is not brilliant. And I was saying he needed to go back and give uh, Sam Cortes a bit of a dig out. I'm not saying he didn't, but you know, but I just thought Grant was doing so well. In the second half, Flores went inside. I said earlier, they were a bit sporadic, they didn't control it. It was like we'll have a go for two minutes and then Pats will take control again. But I just Top Pats were so much in control. The free kick, yeah, I think the keeper was beaten. It was two or three inches the wrong. It hit the outside of the post. It didn't hit the bang and come back out. It was on the outside of it. It was a brilliant uh, free kick. But after that, it was, I think, the, had had the, header, the header, the header down, no one coming in around the back post. Like, you, you'd be always sitting, you sit. You're talking about Graham defending corners, or, you know, for, for, for Bowes defending the freeze, the Moraini's freeze. Uh, he actually came in on, on down the right hand side at one occasion as well in the general play and he cut inside and Doyle just missed one on the far post similar to his deliveries for the goals but uh, but just on the attacking 
you know, so, you know, you might have a blocker, you have your runner, you have your near post, you whatever, you have someone holding for the second phase, but you've always someone coming around the back because the ball, if it beats everyone, and it might just take a touch back across or in a goal, and that Abalabi, the touch on the side of his head, it just drops, and it was just there for a tap in, and somebody needed to be there, and uh, you know, it, it just to tap it in, but. You know, I, I look, Bowers, as I said, I just thought Pats controlled the game. I really did. I, you know, looking at the game, you know, as I said, Forrest are organising things off the ball, pointing fellas in directions, building up the play, not being patient. And when they played in defeat, you know, from the back, they didn't do it. They done it when it was on. They didn't panic. They didn't rush it and stuff. So, yeah, I just think Bowers lost away in the second half. They definitely did. As Jonathan said, obviously, when the third goal went in, it was a bit of sloppy play. The ball was played up into someone's chest. And, uh, you know, the, the Lonergan went in and got the goal. I don't know whether the keeper maybe could have done a bit better, but it was a brilliant finish and it wrapped up the game. But, uh, look, you know, the defending for Bowers on the set pieces as Graham has gone through. I was right in Lyme, and Graham, I don't know who it was, like you said, but he kept everyone on for yeah, two yeah. yards. He just dropped, he just ah, dropped he just, too early, yeah. He either got it mixed up, whether it, they started deep and stepped up or they started high and dropped back. Yeah. He just done the opposite to the rest of the defenders. And, uh, you know, sometimes when that ball is coming in like that, sometimes you're better off starting deep. Goalkeepers don't like it in on top of them. But at least you can come on to the ball, whereas you're up high and you're going back against it. As you said, Graham, you've got to stick to your head to it and win, win as an OG. But it's whatever you do. And, you know, Bowes didn't get it right. They, they got the calls wrong. You know, as I said, they all didn't drop off or they all didn't step out together on the delivery. Yeah, and before we listen to Declan Devine for the Bowes perspective uh, on the final, uh, just a, a final word on Pats and John Daly, Graham. And I, I think you mentioned it in the commentary just uh, in the wake of the... Uh, of the full-time whistle that, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, they they won the cup, but then Stephen O'Donnell left for Dundalk. And instead of it being a launch pad, it ended up being a period of transition. There's a very different feel now uh, for Pats going forward. Yeah, it is. Um, it touched on it. That's the time, like, I think it was probably the Monday after Stevie leaves and goes to Dundalk. And uh, a lot of the players went as well. He, the, a large chunk of them left. I think probably Benson and a few others up and went. And instead of building something, you're nearly regrouping again. And and I think this is the stage. And I know, like, again, John talked about the sacrifice. His wife, Linda, and his two girls are, are stead in Scotland, um, just outside Edinburgh. So it, it, it's, it's you know, big sacrifice for him to be away from his family um, and do the job. But... You see that you see the support he has, Sean O'Connor with him, Alan Matthews on the pitch. I know he would have leaned on Alan a, a lot going into the cup finals, um, with Alan's experience. But it is something Pats can build on, and, and when you see Mason Media signs a three-year contract, Sam Curtis looks like he could go uh, after the, you know if an offer comes in. I think I think if they can tie down Adam Murphy as well, I, I just I think I just love watching him. Play, I, I, he glides around the pitch and he, he moves so effortlessly. Alex Nolan's been a, a signing that went under the radar because they brought him in from UCD. And, and like, I was really impressed with him in, in the second half as well. I thought, Jeannie Mack, like, he, he played as such bravery and he was, he was, I, th I think he just took to the game. And then Lonergan's always going to be a handful. Lonergan's been like that since the age of 12. He's always been a bruiser. You know, and he's always going to be a handful. Conor Carty, I, I know he's on he's on loan from Bolton. Is he, Conor Carty? So I'm not sure if they have him next year. I'm not sure. But, like, they've a, they've a nucleus of a really good squad. If they can add to it, and they will add to it, I, I feel this will give them a platform to do that. And they have more young players coming through. And in fairness to John, he just keeps throwing them in. And he touched on it. He said, look, he was given a chance. John went to Stockport and... and Johnny Mack will remember this because we, we he was around us at the time. John Daly was probably one of the most sought after centre forwards in air time in, in Ireland. And he had a lot of offers and he went to he picked Stockport and he made his debut in the in probably a year after he goes over. He signed for them at 15, and by the age of 16, he made his debut for Stockport. And that was his decision because he says, I'm gonna go somewhere where I'm gonna play early. Um, and and that's where he he somebody had that belief in him, and now he's passing that down to the young players at Pats. And again, full credit to him. And and 
thoroughly deserved to win the cup final because he's done a he's done an unbelievable job since he took over in May. Yeah, and let's listen to Declan Devine as well from the Bulls' perspective. John Daly was talking about a, a lick of paint, really. You know, that that Flores free kick, Afalabi with a chance as well. Small margins. Yeah, but look, Tony, we can't defend the way we defended today. Two set pieces, unacceptable. It's been a body and Achilles heel for us all season. Um, so, for me, the better team won on the day. We had a, a few chances, as you say, but um, it's Pat's where they won us because you can't defend in a cup final the way we defended today and expect to come away with silverware. How important was uh, McManus' yellow card and, and the free kick uh, that ultimately led to a goal? It meant you had to reach off a little bit as well. No, listen, it was disappointing the way we started the second half. We spoke at half time about, you know, we didn't feel we played with an intensity and we sat off them and didn't get our press right. Um, it was too comfortable for Pats at the back in the first half, especially after we scored. And it's just a real wasted opportunity. And from our behalf, you know, we've got to be better in our game management. We've got to be better dealing with set pieces. It's innocuous balls under the box and to lose men and let people out jump us in one headers. That's the most disappointing aspect because we spoke all week about the would be fine margins that would won cups. Thanks, Declan. Thanks, thank you. So that is Declan Devine, Bohemian's manager there. And Johnny, just how would you assess their season? I mean, they started the, the league campaign brilliantly um, back in back in the spring and then ultimately they finished sixth, got to a cup final, uh, came out the wrong side of it. How would you assess it in terms of where they're going for next season as well? I mean, from a club perspective, I think, you know, Graham alluded on and touched on earlier that they're, they're doing fantastic work in the community and, the, you know, the support that was shown yesterday, as I said, Brilliant support, like you I mean. So they, they built that up. Down to the playing po- point of view, you know, they, they probably haven't made any ground. And uh, I would see them a fair bit because I'm up in DCU and they train up in DCU. And, uh, and, you know, Declan came in and he said, look, he needs to get them fit, get them organised. And they started the season really, really well, you know. And then they, they petered off. The end of the season hadn't been too good for them, whether, you know, the last few matches, the, the focus was on the cup final. But, you know, the, 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 that proved to be Achilles' heel for them because missing out on Europe, you know, by not automatically qualifying for Europe, and obviously with Pats winning, Shell's getting through to Europe, which is a, a huge for Shelbourne as well. But to assess their season, I don't think they've moved the team up. They've just levelled, they've kept a level, they've kind of plateaued off, they haven't, like, you know, you, you wouldn't be saying Bowes are going to be knocking at the door next year to to, to, to be uh, chasing Shamrock Overs or Derry or Pats or whatever, the teams have, have finished ahead of them, and uh, you know, even Dundalk, like they, they finished sixth, like draw, Sligo, Cork and UCD finished below them, you know, that's you know, you want... <laughs> You'd want to be finishing. Declan would have been wanting to finish a bit higher. I think he said that he's not. He didn't. He wasn't coming here to finish sixth in the league. They're a fair bit off challenging for league positions, and he didn't make Europe. So probably disappointing for them that he didn't make Europe, and and obviously not winning the cup. So yeah, have they made much progress over the year as a club? I'd say they're making brilliant progress. But on the pitch, probably didn't make too much progress over the year. Yeah, and the lacked squad depth, I think, as well, Raf. You've seen that yesterday yeah. off the bench. They lacked real quality. You can see what Pats were able to bring off the bench, but I, I just thought that squad depth really hurt them in the last stages. Mm. And uh, the Monte Cup finals doesn't come to an end, actually, because next uh, Sunday there's the Women's FAI Cup final, which is going to be at Tala Stadium, and it's going to be live on RT2 and the RT player from 2.15 uh, in the afternoon. And Shelburne at Lone Town, who were in last year's Cup final, they're going to be meeting again. And Shells will go in as favourites, but uh, at Lone, again, they're, they're a club sort of on the rise as well. So it should be a good game. And uh, apart from it being a repeat of last season's final course, uh, Shelburne manager Noel King is also um, stepping away at the end of the season. And that's off the back of winning three trophies in recent years, including a couple of league titles, one being uh, a double as well uh, last year. And in the women's premier division uh, at the weekend, the season came to an end. P Mount United already won the league, uh, but they got celebrating style in front of their own fans with a 6-1 win over Sligo Rovers with the trophy lifted at the end of that. And then Galway United, who've had a brilliant season, finishing fourth, beat Wexford 4-0 away from home. And it has been a season to forget for Wexford. And Shamrock Rovers, their debut season in the division, uh, they finished off with a thriller 4 all against Athlone Town, who were, of course, warming up for the cup final. And then Bowles beat Treaty United 1-0. 
And then Shells warmed up for the final on Sunday with a 5-1 win at Cork City, who finished bottom of the table. But uh, we're going to have a lot of build-up to the cup final anyway on rte.ie slash sport and also on our social channels, so keep an eye on that. And in terms of the playoff final, in the men's first division and premier division, uh, of course, Waterford on Friday beat Cork City 2-1 at uh, Tallis Stadium. And, um, I mean, Graham, it was, uh, you know, I, I saw a bit of commentary about it, uh, you know, in terms of on social media and the likes saying, you know, that maybe the quality wasn't there, but that it was an exciting game. I thought it was a brilliant game to watch in the end. Yeah, it was exciting. Yeah, I think it was uh, what made it exciting was some bad defending and then some bad finishing and then some good, <laughs> like some goals and... Again, both teams just went at it, which was great. Um, it was really good. I watched the, I watched the back, uh, watched the live actually. Sorry, and um, yeah, or like in fairness, I thought Waterford looked the better team in in over the course of the game. Um, I thought they were better. I thought they more a bit more structured about them. Um, and the goal, the goal he got, brilliant goal actually, where he just cuts inside and bends into the top corner. It was a really good finishing. He was dangerous on the night, and then Coughlin just—he's clever buying the penalty. Look, he, he, you know, but it's hard as a defender because you're on the way over and you think, right, I have to—I can't just give him a free shot. I'm gonna, but once his hip is ahead of you, I—I I think if you're going shoulder to shoulder, arm to arm, and you're level, good. But once he has his hip in and you give him that nudge, it's always gonna look like you've pushed him on the back. And um, what a calm penalty as well. Um, and then look, Keith Long, we 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 touched on. Bowes and, and their success and what they've done and Keith Long was a massive part of that from building them up and he's gone down there and Alan Reynolds obviously has gone from Derry in as assistant uh, because of his mum I think his mum was sick at the time and so he, it's I'm delighted for them too to get them over the line Cork on the other hand I just think it's just been a series of errors from the start Colin Healy gone would have been a big loss from because he just had continuity and I think that continuity would have got them, probably would have kept them up I, uh, by hook or by crook. I think they would have stayed up if Colin had a stead. But I think the uncertainty around everything that was happening at the club, that Colin just said, look, this isn't probably isn't for me. Um, and then not putting in a permanent manager until about two months, a month ago or six weeks ago has absolutely killed them. And Johnny, will know, we know this as players and we know this as coaches. If there's uncertainty and who's managing you, players will go, look, you have an excuse. And when you give players an excuse, they'll, they'll always take it. And because it's always, look, it's not on us, look what we're dealing with. So you have to take that away from them and say, look, this is your manager, this is what we're going to do. Um, and I worry for Cork because I'm not sure what direction they're going to go in for next season. They have got to usher the owner. What money does he bring and what players does he get? But where does he get them? That's the thing. Uh, a lot of the young players are either going away or they're playing at a higher level. So it, it becomes a different place to shop. But yeah, it was. It was a really good game, really good advertisement for the for the league as well. And look, Waterford had a great addition. They were one of the sort of big clubs that would have been around for a long, long time. And um, hopefully they do well next season. Yeah, and just on the you know the tactical side in the first half, actually, especially in the final thirds on both ends, wasn't it kind of funny that the game was almost played on one touchline in that in that sense? I mean, the Waterford right hand side that channel, and then also the times that Cork City were getting forward seemed to be a lot down the left. Yeah, and sometimes. Yeah. I, sorry, you oh, sorry, Johnny. Not far away. You go. go. Ahead, you know, you no work. Walk away. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I, I like I, I did think Cork were unlucky with the players they lost. Like I think l- losing Rory Keaton and then and they lost some other players to injury where you're like Yeah, dr- Drynan and Kravchuk, I think as well. Yeah, yeah. and you're, you're thinking like how unlucky are they going into this where you lose them all in the first half? I, I that would have given more for the boost, not seeing Rory Keaton come back out at half time because with the form he's in and the chances he takes, similar to what Coughlin does for for um Warford, when you lose that it's a it's a big one it's a big ask because he he's been the one that's carried them despite all all the stuff that he had to go through on a personal level for him to be playing and he probably again how are Cork gonna hold on to him with the impact he's had this season looks like Aaron Bulger would be going to Shells as well he's another player um that could move on but I, I like I said to you 
I thought Warford were a better structure, had an idea what they wanted to do, similar to what Johnny's saying about Bowes. A lot of the stuff Cork done was sporadic. It was like one player taking the ball, driving with it, where Paul Warford looked a little bit more organised and a lot uh, more structured than Cork. Yeah, and uh, Johnny, just on both clubs, I suppose uh, the Premier Division looks like it's going to be pretty exciting with Galway going up as well uh, for next season and Waterford looking strong and potentially building um, you know that that battle towards the bottom um, for those clubs that do go up and that kind of mid-table battle it's going to be a lot more intense than what it was this season and then of course the other side with Cork City and what faces them now as they you know face into life in the first division yeah, there's a couple of points there. Like, I mean, the, your last point is like Cork now are, are going to be down in Munster playing against Kerry and Cove. You know, I don't know where, as Graham said, I don't know where this leads to for Cork. You know, initially when, when, when Colin Healy left the club, you know, we, we've spoke about Waterford on this podcast a good few times, Raph, and I've said many a time that I wouldn't want to be playing Waterford in the playoff because they, they were building the momentum. They have a plan to get back into the Premier League. And I just thought, from the perspective of Cork, they needed to catch Sligo. And Sligo were there for the taking this year, Raph. They were absolutely plummeting down the table, Sligo. And Cork should have grabbed a hold of that and chased Sligo and made sure he said in the Premier Division. So it wasn't the game the other night for me that lost it for Cork and the tactics and all that. It was the build-up to it and the months that, you know, since Colin Healy left and not getting it right and the uncertainty of it. And now we need to stay in this league no matter what. Every single point, every match, every minute. And I just don't think they addressed it quick enough and I don't, I just, it was one of them, I think we'll be all right, we'll be okay. And as I said, I would have been saying, I don't want to play Waterford. I just want to make sure my job here as a Cork, as a club, as the manager, as whatever it is, the director of football, is to catch Sligo and draw it. And that's what they didn't do. They didn't address it enough. You can say they were unlucky in this and that. They, they had the players, they have the support, they have the structure down there. And that's where they lost it for me. That they were a little bit, maybe... You know, and we'd be all right. We'll get a win next week. Or, you know, we'll beat Trot or we'll beat UCD or we'll get a point against someone. we pull a, a result somewhere. This should have been dealt with. The, the alarm bells were ringing when Colin Healy left and that wasn't dealt with then. So, as I said, on numerous occasions, the last thing I would have wanted to do was play Waterford in the playoffs. And well done, Waterford. Brilliant. Well done to Galway for coming up. They're going to be two brilliant additions to, to the Premier League. And there'll be no, you know, there'll be no one finishing up with 11 points next year with UCD. You know, so it's going to be competitive to answer your question, Raf. you know, for the bottom part, for the middle part and for the European part. And I just think, you know, with Waterford and, and, and Galway coming in, it's just going to add, add to the Premier League. Yeah, and Johnny, what do you make of uh, Shells then? Obviously, uh, as you mentioned earlier, fourth place and Pats winning the cup means they're going to be in Europe, but off the field as well. Um, I have noted down my notes, Shelburne's roller coaster because of the stuff that was happening in terms of the ownership. So Ajun Ilajali walking away now am- amicably um, as as owner, and then consequently also Damien Duff is going to be staying on as manager, signing a new contract, which was announced on Saturday. And when you look at uh, the Shell situation, so they won't have to repay the initial investment that the Turkish ownership uh, made um, and although there's still going to be some sort of strategic partnership between Hull City and Shells going forward and the Irish directors and that's led by Premier Sports' founder Mickey O'Rourke um, are regaining full control of the club and what you make of them that for the future in terms of a Damien Duff staying after you know bringing the club forward over the last couple of years but also I guess that sense of maybe they're sort of back at square one in terms of they were looking for investment. They got it, and now that's sort of uh, in the past now. Well, they, you know, they were fighting on both fronts. They were trying to get the club structured and trying to get it financially viable. They were trying to get it right on the pitch. We've seen it over the last last couple of years with Damien, how, how structured the team was on the pitch, really, really hard to be very fit. And with a couple of players coming in from from Hull, uh, the Hardys, and the, they, they, they've added to the team. Um I think they, they took a chance on the investment. As you, as you just said, Airaf, they're back to square one. I don't think it, it, it's affected them too much. They had a go. They had a look at it to see if it would work out. It didn't work out. It's been a roller coaster season, as you said. I think Damien probably had a, put an, an ultimatum down to say, look, you know, they either go or, I, or I'm going or whatever. I, I don't know exactly what happened, but I think the stability of Damien staying, 
the stability of the money coming in from Europe will definitely help them with them qualifying for Europe in a roller coaster season. That Demi Duff is going to stay on. The club are back to where they started. They haven't lost any 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 momentum. They haven't lost any ground in relation to what the club is trying to do, and they've obviously qualified for Europe. So yeah, I think you know shells are, are are slowly building this, and over the next couple of years. You know, they're going to be competing with the Bowers and the Pats around Dublin and the support that they get. They're sold out on Friday nights and what they do with the development there. A little bit of time now to think on the off-season, but I'm sure they have a plan. But there seems to be a bit of stability now in Shelburne. Yeah, and Shamrock Rovers then, uh, Graham. Obviously, I think last week, Anthony was uh, was hosting the podcast last week and we discussed uh, some of the matters in terms of the off the field. But uh, in the last uh, couple of days, anyway, there's the news in terms of Rory Gaffney uh, re-signing um, despite some interest from Derry City and then Jack Byrne also signing a long-term contract. So there are, you know, it's, it is taking shape for this push for a five in a row next season. Yeah, I think Gaffney's the big one for me. I know, look, I love, I love Jack. <laughs> I actually thought Jack started the season unbelievably well, considering Rovers, I think, the, so many draws in the first seven games. Um, I actually thought it was Jack that was the one that was driving them. Um, and I've I seen a different side to him, because you normally associate with Jack with the nice play and the intricate stuff and the assists, but I actually saw a side where he was driving his team to try and get torn them draws into victories. And... and I was commentating a lot of the games, thinking, well, he's shown a lot of leadership here. I think Jack's 27 now. Um, but Gaffney has just been the one that has, he's the catalyst for everything that they do good going forward. He gives them a platform to play into. He holds the ball up. He brings players in. And when Rovers play with a box, the two lads outside him, whether it's Bork, Towell or Bourne, they know that they can just make runs off them because they know it's going to stick. When you have a striker like that, like you can time that down to wherever you need to go because of that platform that Gaffney gives you. And you're a wonderful player. Um, not just to, like, look, could he score more goals? Every every striker would say he can score more goals. But what he gives them, that that base and that platform, I think it's a terrific sign and um, re-sign and it's a massive boost and it's a little bit of a kick for all the other clubs that are trying to chase them that they don't secure two of their best players on contracts for next year because now there's no there's no way to get at them in terms of oh well we can weaken them and strengthen us so if Gaffney goes to Derry not only is Derry getting strengthened by that but he's a, they're also weakening Shamrock Rovers that's not the case here Rovers just stay strong so there you need to now go and look, we need to go and get a squad that can compete. Pats are similar. How do we go out and bulk our squad in terms of quality with quantity as well? Because you need lads that are going to impact it. Again, we touched on the bows. Their thing of they've got a really strong 12 to 13 players. After that, they're, they're struggling. And we've seen that yesterday when Buckley's injured. Um, the... Radowski, Radowski is suspended as well, so they were struggling then. So they probably need um, reinforcements. I think every club does if they are going to try and compete with Rovers. Yeah, and then Sligo Rovers, uh, Johnny, you mentioned earlier, of course, the during the season they were in free fall in the second half of the season and then stayed up in the end. But there is a bit of flux in terms of the, the squad uh, going forward for next season. David Cawley, a long-time servant, he's uh, he's de- he's departed the club now. And his statement was sort of interesting, uh, the one that was uh, put out on social media. Today I was informed that, unfortunately, I've played my last game for Sligo Rovers. I'm disappointed as this is not the way I had wanted it to end, as I feel I still had more to give. Uh, but that's out of my control. And I have to try and accept the manager's decision. It was an honour to captain the club for so long. I've always tried to set an example by working hard and training hard, given nothing less than 100% when I crossed that white line this is a special club and you the supporters and volunteers are the heartbeat I want to thank you all I wish the club all the best in the future and I will always have uh, happy memories of my years here so um, I suppose Collie uh, Johnny has been a big part of the club over the last uh, you know decade decade or so but you know I think we talked about it with Patrick Hooban and Dundalk a couple of weeks ago on this podcast you don't always get the ending you want and you know football is a bit of a ruthless business well, that's that's the reality of it. I mean, like you know, whether you're there for ten years or eight years, like there's, there's decisions to be made. I mean, there's Ronan Finn gone, Ronan Finn gone out with Rovers. You know, uh, Buckley has also gone out with Sligo Rovers, isn't he? 
the centre half, the the ex Cork lad, he's gone as well. So they're obviously looking at maybe wage bills and cutting back and trying to get maybe three or four players in on, on, on two players' wages. Sometimes that works for you, sometimes it doesn't. But uh, they're obviously trying to restructure uh, the, the, the club from a uh, player's point of view, financial point of view, keeping John Russell on as well. They made a statement earlier that John was going to stay. It looked like John could lose his position as his good young coach. So they're going to give John another go at this. And, uh, you know, they, they, they got off. They got out of jail this year, Raph, and I said it. They definitely got out of jail. They, they, they were free-falling, as you said. And, uh, you know, you know they need to do something because Galway coming into this and, and as you said, Waterford coming into it, it's going to be tougher league than it was uh, last season. With the draw of us who can go on and beat teams, you know, they, they, they can pick up points. So there's going to be no easy games in next season. So I think Sligo are going to struggle next season in, in, in that league. And, uh, you know, McCauley going, Buckley going, you know, they'll be relying on young players. Will the young players get you through? They deal with a mix of experienced players. But uh, I don't think things look too good for Sligo for next season and what I've seen over the last year. Yeah, and uh, just before we go, we'll talk about uh, the Republic of Ireland squad uh, going forward uh, for this uh, these final two games of the year for, uh, for Stephen Kenny's side. And of course, the final Euro 2024 qualifier against the Netherlands, uh, which is away from home. It's on Saturday, 18th of November, this Saturday, 7.45 kickoff, and then coverage underway at 7 p.m. on RT2, RT Player. We'll also have radio coverage, and also it's going to be on RT.ie in terms of updates uh, for people uh, to keep an eye on if they're not in front of a radio or a television and the squad itself there's not there's no real major changes in, in terms of players that have been brought in Troy Parrott comes back uh, there's a doubt over Evan Ferguson's fitness uh, for one anyway he had a he suffered a knock in the Europa League against Ajax uh, last Thursday and consequently didn't play for Brighton uh, at the weekend uh, either but in general uh, Kelleher also comes back as well but uh, Graham I suppose the, the, the James McLean isn't included in the initial party but of course he's going to be involved in the New Zealand game next Tuesday and uh, I think we've talked about him a bit on this podcast but uh, he's been a great servant and that'll be a great occasion for him Yeah he will and fully deserves it I know the, 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 the FAI stopped doing testimonials years ago but for someone like James McLean you see how much playing for his country means to him uh, he wears his heart and his sleeve in that regard and um be a great occasion and we touched on like you said not being able to bow out the way you want sometimes this is a, a case for James to be able to bow out on his terms from his Ireland career he'd probably be like, look he'd probably be disappointed the campaign hasn't gone that well as a uh, for the team um, and it's been and it's been tough but I think the FAI are trying to get a handle on this and trying to put structures in place and trying to get the, the right method all the way through and, and it's going to take time um, it is, it, it's not just a quick fix and, and unless they start, unless we as a country start fixing the stuff underneath it that your top is constantly going to just be patching over the paper and over the cracks a little bit um, but yeah James McLean he's been a fantastic servant for his country he's, he's always been available to play um and and fully deserves whatever send off he's going to get against New Zealand and um wish him all the best in it. Yeah, let's listen to Stephen Kenny, obviously Ireland manager, and his future is obviously um under scrutiny at the moment. Uh, we don't know what the the story will be in terms of renewal or non renewal of his contract beyond uh, these final uh, couple of games. But he was speaking to Tony O'Donoghue after name of the squad last week. From your own point of view, Stephen, I mean. You clearly want to, I imagine, continue with the Irish job. Is that, are you you're putting your name forward that you want to continue the, the work that you've already done? Well, I'm not putting my name forward, but uh, you know, I'm in the position. I think uh, um, I like to look at this squad now that we've named. It's a reflection of the work we've done over the last three years. Um, obviously, it's been a radical shift with, through our own system in Ireland. We brought 20 players into the first team in what needed to be a radical shift yeah, because the team was at the end of the cycle and not, and not many players available beyond that. Any other players had gone down to divisions. So I think a lot of the players that, that were omitted. So this is a, a new Irish team now and you know, it could well be my last two games. That could be, it could be the case. But if that is the case, whether it is or it isn't, 
I'm proud of what the squad will represent, I think, uh, with the skill levels and values that it has, and will go on to be, you know, be a good team. Do you want to continue the work with this squad? Of course squad? I do, yeah, but that's, that, uh, you know, I'm not making a, a plea for that. Uh, you know, I think we'll go and play against Holland, to go and play New Zealand, and that's, uh, you know, you know, it's, it's not about me personally, it's about what's best for Irish football, and uh, that's it. You have been linked with the Lincoln City job recently, and I'm sure you'll be linked with lots of jobs yeah. if you become available. You can link with, link, speculation can lead to anything, but, you know, for me, I'm, biggest privilege is to manage uh, Republic of Ireland. That is Ireland manager Stephen Kenny there, kind of touching on his own future, um, which again, as he kind of alluded to there, there's a bit of uncertainty beyond uh, the end of this year. But uh, Johnny, just on the what he was talking about in terms of what he has built, in terms of the, the actual personnel and the squad, because um, there had to be a bit of turnover. There's been a lot of young players uh, coming in and over the last, you know, three years of his uh, tenure. What do you make of the squad that he's built in terms of whether he takes forward or if there is a successor uh, appointed if he if he does if he does go? Well, you know, he, he spoke about bringing 20 players. That's a, that's a massive turnover of players coming into the, into the national force team squad over the last couple of years. I think, you know, from the perspective of what Stephen tried to do and the way he's tried to play and, and, and the structure of the team and the, and the way he tried to get the team to play, he had to change it around maybe sometimes as well. He, he, he a little bit more direct because sometimes you just can't go toe to toe and they'll play, t- you know, teams that are from a, a different class or a different level. But uh, I think the young players coming through will have gained so much experience at playing at this level. And, you know, Stephen would have looked at them and said, are you, are you able for this level? Are you not? Will Stephen get the benefit of that? I don't think so. I think the next manager will, will reap the rewards of Stephen giving these lads a chance and bringing them through to the first team. I don't know. You Sometimes... You, do they all deserve to play a full international level? I don't know. Uh, only Stephen knows that and and the players he brought in. But some of them have come through like, uh, brilliantly. And I just don't think Stephen's going to get the benefit of it. I think time has run out for him. I think he, he said it there and I, 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 and I believe it. He's so proud to have been the manager of Ireland. I think he's given it everything that he, he, he could have given it, you know, in regards to the circumstances. Obviously, international, you can't buy players. You've got to deal with what the players you have. And he's tried to mix it up as best he can. And he's given all these young players, you know, the platform to go and play that, you know, that we know them and we can see them in, in the future. Will it bring us to the next level of France and Spain and England? No, I think we're miles off it yet. I think we really are. And I think Graham's touched on stuff there about our young players coming through and getting right underneath. Um, if we're playing... as you know, League One and Championship, it's not the level that you're going to be qualifying for tournaments. But still, we probably could have qualified. You know, with, with the way the structure is of the of the of, of the the tournaments, the competitions, then the, you know, FIFA are making it a little bit easier for for you to qualify. But uh, I just think time has run out for Stephen, and I think he's 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 done everything that he could have done, and he's he's very proud of managed Ireland. And uh, to answer your question, yeah, we have brought some good young players through. Yeah, and then uh, I suppose the Dutch game itself, Graham, it'll be intriguing how they sort of approach it, given that uncertainty, but also because the group, essentially, it's been long over in terms of Ireland maybe trying to get into the top two. That was long done, and, um, you know, that's uh, you know that's not really an ambition uh, now. And also the separate stream in terms of the playoffs, that's even in narrowing further because um, Israel losing 1-0 in Kosovo last night wasn't a great result for Ireland in terms of the, the Nations League rankings because Israel will probably will more than likely need a playoff given the position in their own group with the Swiss second and Romania uh, top in that group five points clear with uh, three games remaining for the Swiss and the Israelis. It's just, uh, it's going to be, I guess it's going to be a slightly strange game from an Irish perspective given there's nothing really riding on it on Saturday. Yeah, I was at the game when Holland came um, and it, we started really well. High intensity went after them. I think uh, Johnny touched on it a lot, a little bit with the going toe to toe team. I, I, I sometimes think when we when you look at Ireland and you say, right, we want to dominate the ball and, and we're going to control the game, that's okay because you're going to have moments where you have momentum and you, and you will dominate it. 
But the, the other team's going to have moments when they have momentum and they're going to dominate the ball. And I sometimes think that, or it's like we look and think, well, why, why, how come they're having the ball? Why don't we have it? And we, we need, like, we should be dominating. And yet, that's not the way football works. You, you, you can have the ball for a certain amount of time. But what I've seen with this, with Stephen Kenny's Ireland, is that they're not willing to suffer in games. They're not willing to go, look, you are having a good moment. You are going to have the ball a little bit. We're going to be defensively sound and structured. And we might even be a counter-attacking team for five minutes or ten minutes or whatever. Right, we get we rest some momentum back off you, and now we're going to dominate the ball. And I haven't really seen that. That it's like a game management type of thing that you have that you manage this different scenarios in the game. And um, we do it with the young players, coach them. Right, you're one nil down. How do you come back into the game? You're one nil up. How do you how do you see out the game? So things like that. And, that, and look, that's simplistic in in the explanation, but it, it can be a little bit more complicated than that. But how he approaches this game, does he go 4-3-3 against them? Holland actually played 3-5-2 against us to start the game, and at half time, he came out, and he went back to 4-3-3. Um, and what happened was, the Dutch are just so comfortable in 4-3-3 that I was talking to a, um, a, a Dutch friend that was over at the game, and he said as soon as they switched to 4-3-3, the centre-backs had more options with their passes. Everything just clicked for them, and they, and they seen out the game really well. I'd like to see Ireland go 4-3-3 against them and see where they're at because they are playing against one of the big nations who would, would be used to this system. I'd like to see us, how we do against them in, their, in a 4-3-3 against their 4-3-3 and see what comes out and if it's something we can work on. But I do, I echo what Johnny says. Stephen Kenny's done all he can. He's really proud um, to manage Ireland. All he's ever wanted is the betterment of Irish football. Um He's probably going to see out the campaign and then he, he, he moves on. And I, and I think that's amicable from both parties. And you can see he's coming out and, and he's thank, he's grateful for the Ireland job. The FBI are grateful to have him as well. And he's and he's doing his business really well as he's walking out the door. And that's important because you don't, what you don't want is a scenario where, you know, Stephen's lost and everybody had lost Irish football and everybody's having a go at him. And the FAI don't have a good relationship with him because he's somebody that might help further down the road. Yeah, and also to note the under twenty ones face Norway live on RT two and RT player on Friday at four thirty, and they've won three from three so far in the group, and this is an important window. Norway and Italy uh, to come as well, and one of the former twenty ones as well. Before we go, um, Jake O'Brien. Um, scored the winner for what is a struggling Olympic Lyon S side in League uh, League One with a far post header last night, and uh, he would have started his career Cork City before moving to Crystal Palace in 2021. And we did talk about him a few weeks ago on the podcast, but uh, just for both of you lads, like how how well do you remember him? I suppose the 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 younger Jacob Ryan at Cork City, and I might start with you, Johnny, and then uh, get Graham's thoughts there. Look, you know we. The op the option now for the players to go the likes of Jake now that when you know years ago was we say with, with Graham going to, the options now are greater where they can go and go to France or Belgium now at sixteen they don't the the Brexit you have to wait now till they're eighteen and go and uh, it just gives them so much more opportunity we we spoke about the likes of John Daly going at fifteen and sixteen and and they're getting games they're getting game time in, in the European so. It's it's great. It's it's and they might be a bit off the radar, Raf. You know what I mean? Like you you were, you know, foraging to find the results and see how they played and all that. Generally, people wouldn't see that, and uh, it only comes to, to light when they get brought into international teams and whatever else. But look, you know, I I think for him to go and and and, and doing what he's done and to be playing at senior level, you know, in in. European club or European club in Europe is great, and you know I think that's going to be there for for more of the kids coming out, out of Ireland as well, and and it just opened up pathways, didn't it? Like uh, the lad from Pats and Banker, he went to Indonesia, yeah. So, yeah, Indonesia. Yeah. So look, it, it's yeah, it's just open different pathways for players, and it gives them different options, and then also you know you're looking at say because of Ferguson and uh, you know at Brighton. The clubs in England now are kind of going, how do we miss him? 
I think the clubs in England have taken their eye off the ball, Graham, over the last few years, you know, because they've been looking elsewhere for different players. And I, I think there's going to be an influx of, you know, maybe scouts again here in Ireland looking to make sure they don't miss it out on the Ferguson or whatever else. But, uh, you know, different pathways for the younger players going out nowadays. And I think it's a, it's brilliant for them and great options. Yeah, and Graham, just on uh, just on Jacob Ryan, I suppose, going doing that journey, Cork City, Crystal Palace, lots of loan moves as well while he was a Palace, and then moving to what is a huge club in Lyon and now starting to get a run of games. I think he's partnering Dejan Lovren, the former Liverpool defender and former Croatia defender at the back, which, you know, maybe would have been unimaginable for him a few years ago. And of course he has uh, you know, he played in uh, played for the under twenty ones previously as well, multiple caps there and you know, as much as Lyon are struggling um, in, in the French League at the moment, it's still a huge club and a great experience for them. And sometimes that's when you get your chance when the team is struggling because they look to something different and what they have in their building. Um, I remember them coming through at Cork a little bit and, and like again, play, playing there, you see with Sam Cortes, but you play early and it attracts interest because especially in defensive positions because Normally, they throw on a 17-year-old striker just to have an impact for 20 minutes. But when a defender comes through and plays regularly, you, you go, oh, it's like goalkeepers. Gavin Bazuna was the same. Oh, a 15-year-old goalkeeper played. The lad who, the Italian goalkeeper that went to Paris Saint-Germain. I, I don't oh, know. Donnarumma, yeah. He started Donnarumma, he, yeah. Donnarumma played early as well. And then that goes round, well, oh. You've thrown in a 16-year-old goalkeeper. It's the same a little bit with defenders. If you play young as a defender, especially as a centre-back, it attracts interest and then that puts them into Palace. Um, look, the pathway to break through to a Premiership team is tough. Um, so him making the decision to go to Leon and, and then he gets the chance to play, he's probably looking at it thinking, I know we're struggling as a team, but I'm getting game time. And his job is to try and help them get results and, and he's in a position to do it. I do, I do agree a little bit with Johnny. I think about 10 years ago, I think the scouts stopped coming. I think some of the bigger clubs stopped even having scouts at one stage. They just had people doing reports for them. Now it's starting to come back. I think you see what happens is that a trend, a little trend starts happening. So the goalkeeper situation, a lot of goalkeepers start getting taken after Gavin Bazunu. Um, then you see it with Evan Ferguson, now you see Mason Media being a, a big name. You see Michael Newman, who's, who does really well in the Victory Shield. Um, and, and again, that type of striker, that good presence, willing to hold the ball up, and he has legs to run. You know, um, we've got lads probably coming through, the likes of Brody Lee from Tipperary, Charles, Akin and Toyo. Um, again, so what happens is they go, oh, how do we miss seven? Well, we're not missing the next one. And and that that's how the interest comes, and 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 that's the way it's been. It, it tends to follow a little bit of a pattern, um, but again, not going to not going to um, the UK till you're eighteen has opened up European options. I think it's a it's a case that picking the right club to go to is massive, and it's not just at the behest of you know somebody putting you in. You have to go and earn it. So yeah. Um, yeah. You full credit to him, and and, and it's and, and look goes and plays well for the twenty ones. You can kick on and, and and go on and play in scene in the senior squad. Yeah, so just a reminder of the live coverage on RTE over the next, uh, well, it'll be more or less uh, the next long weekend. So Friday, the under twenty ones are going to be in action in the afternoon. And then Saturday evening, that is going to be the Republic of Ireland senior men's team playing against the Netherlands away from home. And then on Sunday, the women's FAI Cup final. And we'll be reviewing that match in full on next week's podcast and also building ahead to the New Zealand friendly as well. Of course, we talked a little bit about James McLean, but that could be Stephen Kenny's final match in charge. We won't know that for, for the moment. But anyway, that's it for this week's podcast. Graham and Johnny, thanks very much for your time. Thanks very much. Cheers, Ralph. Thank you.